So I've decided that the basic rate of income tax will remain at 20%, and it will do so indefinitely until economic circumstances allow for it to be cut. The Chancellor says he needs to do all of that, that series of reversals uh, to bring stability to the economy. But just think about what we have seen since Friday. Just since Friday, Liz Truss has had to sack her Chancellor, Kwasi Kwarteng, replace him with a Chancellor who undid almost everything she was elected by the Tory party members to do, leaving many people, including many Tory MPs, asking what is the point of Liz Truss now. The Chancellor is clearly behind the wheel, driving as quickly as possible away from the Prime Minister's signature policies. And Liz Truss is in the back seat, strapped in, presumably wondering when she'll be dropped off at a bus stop. How long do you give her? 03030 80 55 55. We'll take your text at 81771. Felicity Houston, Conservative Party member, is with me in the uh, Talkback studio. Peter Caldwell, political editor at Talk Radio, author of The Secret Life of Special Advisors, as a former one himself. And Claire Purcell, Conservative Councillor in Kent, former government advisor for the Conservative Party, too. Welcome to all of you. Good to have you with us. How long do you give the Prime Minister uh, Liz Truss in her current role? Uh, oh, Felicity. I, my granny didn't approve of gambling, and I think she, I, can't, I think she was right. Um, I, I don't know. I really don't. I mean, it, what's been going on is is so extraordinary and so un precedented that it's very hard to know. I mean, she could be gone this afternoon. I think she should just sit in checkers, you know, turn her phone off and dig in and make them move her. You know, don't go voluntarily. She was well, become a squatter. Yeah, why not? Nobody else. I mean, nobody elected. Uh, nobody picked uh, Jeremy Hunt as chancellor. You know. Well, she did. Well, yes, I know. But I mean, you know, the members picked. The only offer we got was her or Rishi, and the members picked her. And obviously, the parliamentary party didn't expect that to happen. And mm-hmm. they're making sure that we got it wrong, we're going to have to re- vote again, basically, in the best traditions. Yeah. And Peter Cobwell, Liz Trust now appears to be, what, channeling her inner Rishi. She's doing a kind of Rishi cosplay act, isn't she, with her policies? She certainly has no authority whatsoever. Um, her plan on which she was elected is gone completely when so many people, the markets, economists, um, and and so many people in her cabinet as well repudiated it and we now have a complete reversal of that it's completely humiliating for her jeremy hunt is undoubtedly the most powerful person in this country mm. at the moment and i people will be asking what's the point of liz truss trussonomics had a short life um and it's dead now and it will be remembered it will not be forgotten but it certainly had a big impact politically as well as economically and um, it's good to see the markets are rallying a bit the pound <coughs> is stronger now as a result of jeremy hunt's statement but I mean, Liz Trust just has absolutely no authority whatsoever. I just, I, 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 I these things always take longer than you think they will. Really? Um, I've, yeah. you know, I've been been in and around politics for for twelve years, and people going uh, always always takes longer. People thought Theresa May was going for a long time. People thought Boris Johnson was going for a long time before they both did. And uh, I think Liz Trust it may take longer than we think. But at the same time, it will take a while for the Conservative Party to to get its house in order if it ever does between now and twenty twenty four. But there's definitely, uh, I think her days are definitely numbered. Uh, what is really going on here, Claire? It would seem that the the Tory parties, um, the parliamentary party, the MPs want a new prime minister, and and they're out to get one. And the only thing holding Liz Truss in office at this point is they haven't agreed on one yet. Is that is that fair? Yes, I do think that's fair. And also we need to remember that there is no mechanism to remove Liz Truss as Prime Minister as the rules currently stand. So she is Prime Minister pretty much in name only at the moment, as as both of uh, my colleagues there have just said. Yeah, Pino is is, is the term now, isn't it? Pino. (laughs) Indeed, indeed. Prime Minister in name only. We, we do like these kind of acronyms, but uh, I think it's a pretty woeful state for the Conservative Party to have got itself into. And there is no easy way out of this. Mm-hmm. I somehow feel that we need to perhaps just calm down. The Chancellor's statement has seemingly landed quite well. The markets are looking quite positive and he will make his statement in the chamber of the House of Commons uh, this afternoon where we'll see a little bit more detail laid out. But I think that at the moment we just need to to calm down, let this settle, let this look. I do Mm. think her days are seriously numbered, but there is and should be no move to get rid of her straight away. 
in, in many ways, this is more of the same with Liz Truss, isn't it, Peter? From Lib Dem to Tory, from someone who said she was a Republican to a monarchist curtsying with the Queen, from a Remainer to a Brexiteer, from a Libertarian in economics to now bring in Jeremy Hunt, let's do Treasury orthodoxy. Yeah, she certainly changed her mind a number of times. There's nothing wrong with changing your mind. Um, but but she, that's, that's constitutionally that's of, flip-flopping, that, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Although, ironically, I suppose the the huge length of, or the considerable length of time, 12 years really, between her becoming an MP in 2010, Conservative MP in 2010, lots of time in government, and she wrote a chapter of a book called Britannia Unchained, which Quasi Quarting also contributed to, saying that uh, that this economic plan was something she wanted to do. So this is this is one of her most consistent beliefs, is trustonomics, um, the idea that you cut taxes and, and that stimulates growth. Uh, and, it, and it just didn't work at all. Um, I just don't see any real point in her being Prime Minister mm-hmm. at the moment. I don't see what that gains her, what that gains the Conservative Party, what that gains the country, necessarily. And whilst the change will be Uh, very painful for um, the Conservative Party and Labour will be rubbing their hands with glee. And I mean, if I was Keir Starmer, I would just, I would lean into the sort of boring uh, label that's put on him. I would call myself no drama Starmer. And I would say, you know, you've had absolute, um, you know, politics has not stopped for the last seven years. Um, I would say if I were Keir Starmer, I'd say elect me and I'll I'll make politics boring again to, uh, to, 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 um, to adopt a phrase from uh, from from uh, Donald Trump. Uh, Wendy would like to know: Didn't Felicity Houston vote for Liz Truss? Well, that was the, we only had a choice of two. We either had, as a member, you had a choice between Rishi and Liz. None, no, almost no member I know, nor any of the polling of the members, showed that any of us wanted to have either of them. Mm-hmm. But the system ha- is that the MPs whittle them down to two. What and persuaded they gave you that Liz Truss was the better of those two? Because I preferred her concepts of some of her economic ideas. The libertarian stuff? Yes, yes. The stuff that's now been trashed? Quite. Well, because the markets didn't like it. I mean, the only people in charge of this country at the moment isn't Liz Truss or even Jeremy Hunt. But she's it's a free the market. Market. She says she's a free marketeer. Yeah, but then You've she's... got to pay attention to the markets if you're a free marketeer. Yes, but now Jeremy Hunt has just done everything. Interesting, the one thing that doesn't seem to have been cancelled in all this is the cap on the ba- bankers' bonuses. Well, only because it had... Well, only because mm. it was kind of going down the road already, wasn't it? Well, anybody could have changed that there too. There were a couple of other measures that things. are still in there. I think we've got the cut in national insurance still because it well, was it's already, already being implemented, par, halfway through reducing Parliament. stamp duty in England. But it's, I do think survived. the only thing anybody has said this morning is, are the markets happy? Nobody's asked if the people... Was the problem the, the tax cuts happy? or the problem the unfunded tax cuts? I think actually the biggest problem that certainly some of the economists say, if we're going to worry about the markets all the time, is her promise to basically pay everybody's energy bills because nobody knew what that was going to be. They still can't really guess. The energy price, gas prices have gone serious? down there. Are you serious? That's, well, that's the problem in this well, that's what a that's lot, the bit that most people say is the good bit. A lot, no, because it's you can't. It's it's how long is a piece of string? Well, you got to pay for it at some point, but that's but the bit you don't they're holding know how long it to. is. No, you can calculate. That's the bit the public likes. Of course, it does because it's a direct subvention. But I'm talking about the markets, which everybody cares about, and the biggest thing the markets were most worried about. The other ones can be I would calculated. Have thought the, the thing that they were most worried about, Felicity, honestly, was the unfunded tax cuts, the 45 percent. Tax rate being those can cut be calculated. for the super rich. That's the difference. Well, you can work those numbers out. They may the not be right. The lack of the OBR being but involved. You cannot the work lack out of planning through this. You can't work out what the subvention on the energy markets was going to be. At mm. the moment, gas, hill price, hill prices have gone down. If Putin does the unthinkable to Ukraine, mm-hmm. imagine what's going to happen, gas. And remember, the rest of Western Europe has gas storage. We don't. Uh, Peter, what do you think the markets were most scared about? I think they were scared about the fact that this was totally unfunded and that there was no plan. Um, we've seen the Institute for Fiscal Studies, we've seen the International Monetary Fund talk about a gap between what was planned, what was put forward, and what was the reality. Mm-hmm. And the fact is there was a set, between, depending on who you believe, between a 60 billion and a 72 billion black hole here. Mm-hmm. So Jeremy Hunt has done something to make that better. There still seems to be about 30 billion pounds of cuts probably to public spending that will be needed at some stage fairly soon and we'll probably hear more about that uh, in the next couple of weeks but I'm not surprised that he acted so quickly today because if you look at everything Jeremy Hunt has done over the last three three and a half days it has been to try to reassure the markets lots of media over the weekend 
and, and unfortunately, whether you like it or not, markets are a fact of life and they control money and they control money for real people, whether that's interest rates so, in terms of mortgages, whether that is uh, pension funds. I mean, it's not its not just some foreign concept. It's not just yeah. city, wide boys but in Felicity the city. But Felicity says London. it was the this energy, pa- real it was the energy packet, package that worried the markets. Well, that was part of it, I think. But nonetheless, what has happened today is that it's been cut back. It was mm. due to be two years. Uh, it's now going to be six months. And I think that people will be really concerned about that mm-hmm. because in six months' time, I think we're going to be in a very strange position where people will have had their energy bills subsidised. The energy companies will be posting probably record profits again, as they often right. do. Uh, and we'll be in a situation where people will say, well, hold on a second, my taxes have been uh, subsidising the energy companies. Mm-hmm. I've been getting some money from the government the energy companies are getting huge profits, and now that money has run out, and my energy bills have gone through the roof. So I think the government has actually got a big problem in six months' time, but to guarantee that for two years just wasn't financially sustainable. And just if you're just joining us, just to update you on this, what the Chancellor, uh, Jeremy Hunt, has just announced there is that this energy price guarantee uh, will continue until April of next year, and the government, he has just announced that they're going to have a, a Treasury-led review to work out how best to support people after that period, but you're only, you've only now got that energy price guarantee until April of next year. Paul is in Belfast. Hello, Paul. Hello, William. How do you say it, Paul? Um, I agree entirely with what Peter has just succinctly said in respect of the markets and the economy. There's an underlying uh, difficulty here, not just with the Tory party, but it happens to be with them because they've been in government for uh, most of the uh, post-war years. Uh, it used to be that if you step wrong, you stepped aside. Uh, unfortunately, that stopped with uh, Boris Johnson. We now have Liz Truss effectively passing the prime ministerial parcel to uh, Jeremy Hunt. And mm-hmm. therein lies the problem. There isn't really a mandate for what's happening. Um, it really should be a matter of going to an election, not simply seeing how this plays out. And Liz Truss can effectively cling to power if, there, if those rules are not changed. But um, I think it's somewhat ludicrous to say that you do not pay attention to the markets. You do not uh, have a check uh, on what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Even if it is a mini budget, you need to have that support. And there was almost literally no one, as Peter uh, named the Institute for Fiscal Studies, the IMF, no one, even Joe Biden, felt uh, obliged to say something and then halted himself. <laughs> but it really was. He re- she really was on an island of her own. But he might underlying... have halted himself a bit earlier because he did actually come out and say something. Well, he did. Well, he did. But I think it was, in fairness, it was uh, stating what... I think he was eating an ice cream while he was yeah, saying they, it. Well, so they, they said your stormer is vulnerable. I actually think it's Rishi Sunak who absented himself from the conference and did so... Uh, on the basis that he, you know, well, ostensibly yeah. not to take the limelight from her, but I think it was not to be there to listen to what was going to unfold, mm-hmm. and it has now unfolded. Right. I do think, I do think, as a party, they've lost, they've lost that uh, underpinning from the electorate. The Jim, mandate's not there. Jim, thank you very much. A lot of people are texting and saying, you know what, the obvious solution is, we need a change in the law so that if a prime minister steps down in office. We go straight to a general election. It should not be left to either Labour Party members or Conservative Party members to replace a Prime Minister. Claire, what do you think of that proposal? I think that sort of runs you into some big risks. What happens if uh, somebody passes away in office, for example? I, th- I think it's it's very easy to say, run in and change the law, mm. and there yeah. would be an election far too frequently. I think that governments need a slightly longer term in order to get their plans and underway. We're not, we're not a presidential through. system, obviously. Absolutely. You don't pick the Prime Minister. And, and I think sometimes we, we all forget that. You vote for your local MP, you vote for that person to come in, and you know, should that party then form government, <laughs> so be it. So I think you, you're in quite sort of dangerous constitutional territory if you say that we'll go to the country every single time. And I think it wastes an awful lot of time. Any work that was started would then potentially be discontinued. Mm. And that's not good for the stability of the country. Right. That doesn't help people plan. Though a number of people have pointed out, Claire, that it's, it will be faster to have a general election than to allow the Conservative Party leadership system <laughs> to choose a new leader. It didn't I need don't... to be that long. It didn't need to be that long, but it was long, wasn't it, Claire? It, it, it was, and it's a sort of an unedifying spectacle, this sort of blue-on-blue fighting, which we saw through the summer. And the membership were given... 
two choices. And they made their choice. So we had to take it as as read. But I think now we don't really have the time or the luxury to go through that process once again. This is going to anger Tory membership um, hugely. And I've seen it with my own association. The comments coming out are, we made our choice. The MPs should not overturn it. So you are seeing a divide now within association members mm. and activists. So whichever way you look at it, it isn't good. You are never going to come out with, I don't believe, one candidate that is going to satisfy everybody. Yeah. So I think that we, for the good of the country, we just need to get this sorted. We need some stability. The markets, whether you like them or not, have rallied round. They understand where Jeremy Hunt is going with his fiscal policy. At and least it's clear. At least it's clear. It, yeah, It is. And that's what they want. They want some clarity, whether yeah. they agree with it or not. It's not a political thing right. for the markets. They just need a little bit of certainty and to understand where to price in what's going on. So, Peter, what we've got now is we've got Rishi Sunak sitting there saying nothing, wondering at what point do, do they knock on my door, right? He's probably on manoeuvres. You've got Penny Mordant, You've got Jeremy Hunt, who's now looking like the Prime Minister. You've got Ben Wallace, who hasn't spoken, I think, in weeks, the Defence Secretary, who may turn out to be the John Major in this scenario and walk in as the unity candidate or the compromise candidate. Whichever one you go for, you're going to have party problems. You, you may even have parliamentary uh, problems as well with Conservative MPs who don't particularly like a particular candidate. But it looks like that's the plan, isn't it, uh, Peter? Yeah. One of these guys is going to become the unity candidate. Graham Brady's going to go to Liz Truss and say, you know, we don't need to have a rule change here. You need to step down because if you don't, we're going to have a rule change and you're going to be put out. Yes, indeed. And that would be even more of a bloodbath and he will appeal, I would imagine, to Liz Truss to yeah. put uh, Give her a dignified party. exit rather than humiliating yes. exit. Yes, indeed. And in terms of uh, the next unity candidate, I mean, the problem with the unity, unity candidate is that the Conservative Party is so incredibly <laughs> divided. I mean, I think uh, Mother Teresa could be the unity candidate and there would still be people who wouldn't be happy and think it should be them. Um, I think what might happen <laughs> is that they may put a sort of top team together, essentially mm. divvy up the rules, first of all, and present that to the members, something like... Uh, for example, Rishi Sunak is Prime Minister, Penny Morton is Deputy Prime Minister and, and uh, Foreign Secretary and so on and actually sort of put out, lay out the first a, sort of a, top a four or five of all roles. the talents, yes. Yes, indeed, and, and bringing together all wings of the Conservative Party mm. in a way that Liz Truss chose, uh, for better or worse, I would argue worse, uh, not to do. She put, of, of all her cabinet, only one of them uh, was someone who didn't vote for her and didn't support her, and that wasn't a very senior cabinet minister at all. That was um, a, a very junior cabinet minister. So I think that she is someone who doesn't have much time left, and the person yeah. who succeeds her will have a, a massive... Uh, massive job in their hands, especially when the Labour Party will instantly and is indeed calling for an election. They're so far ahead in the polls, they have nothing to lose by calling for an election. And uh, it will be, it'll be very hard for... There'll be so many people in the country who say, well, why not have one? Because it's. I don't think there's been a case post-war, I could be wrong on this, but yeah. I don't think there's been a case post-war where there have been two changes for Prime Minister without I think an that's election. Right. I think that's right. And if we are, as you say, Peter, we are. if we are going for this kind of... If they are going for this kind of ecumenical cabinet, you know, drawing in different parts of the party, that will take a bit of time to put together. We are talking yeah. to Felicity Houston, Peter Cardwell and Claire Purcell, and we're taking your calls, 030 30 55, 55. How long do you give her? Who's your replacer? Jim is in London Derry. Hi, Jim. Hello, William. Good to speak to you. You too. Uh, I've tried talking to you before about debt, and that's where we are. We've got 2.3 in excess trillion of pounds in debt. Yeah. Now, Liz Truss, in a sense, hasn't broken the rules, really. What she's trying to do is be more fiscally responsible. She went the wrong way about it. I agree with that. Now, the SNP is 20 billion in debt, I think. Northern Ireland's run out of money. We've had two decades of QE. We used to have the financial high ground, the Conservatives, I mean. Where has that all gone wrong? It's all down to QE, debt, and we can't sustain it. 
Thank you very much, Jim. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. And of course, lots of countries have debt. And Jim making the point there that he actually agrees, I think he, he agrees with some of the key ideas of trustonomics, but the way she went about it, you've got to bring the markets with you if you're going to do market-led transformations. You've got, you can't scare them, right? You've got to get the plumbing right. Let's go to Wesley in Cumber. Hi, Wesley. Good afternoon. Um, my problem is, no matter who takes the job, there's always going to be these sneaky wee people stabbing people in the back. You know, in the Conservative Party, it's sort of a thing. You're allowed to do it. Now, if you want to put it Donald Trump's way, Donald Trump seen people stabbing in the back. What did he do? He fired them on the spot. He fired them in public. Well, he got somebody else he to fire them, them usually. Media. You know, he, he wasn't afraid. Now, the thing was, she was only in, she was only in power six weeks or eight weeks. Mm. And there's nobody standing behind her. She made a mistake. And instead of her people standing behind her and saying, OK, you made a mistake. We should have sorted this out in private. We didn't do it. So let's get it sorted out together as a team and do it together. Everybody shoulder behind the wheel. And let's see if we can make a dent in the next election. But, but what, no, what was no the mistake she made? What was the mistake you think she made, Wesley? I think she went ahead and she made the changes without bringing her party with her. Mm -hmm. Now, she should have run that behind the scenes and said, look, will this float? Will this, will this, you know, bar with the people? But she didn't. Before she even mm -hmm. announced her budget, there was people stabbing her in the back. Yeah. And as a party, it, it should never be allowed. I would call them people out and I would fire them from their jobs on the spot. Wesley? And, Wesley, thank you. Elected, but you can make life difficult. Thank you very much. And, and Wesley's making the point there, Felicity, that she didn't bring her party with her. Well, from what we know uh, ahead of this mini budget, she didn't tell her cabinet. She didn't tell the Bank of England. She didn't do any market briefings. She sacked Tom Scholar, the permanent secretary at the Treasury, who was advising on ways in which you might roll this out so you don't scare the markets. She didn't bring anybody with her. I think it was this almost presidential approach. Um, she, um, she, I mean, I think there is no doubt that the, the comms, to use the term that yeah, your profession would use, exactly, was woeful. Um, and I think, I don't know what that was about. I mean, maybe she's got people in there around her who are rather inexperienced as well. I mean, they always said this is Boris's problem, that really the people who surrounded him didn't have a clue. Well, Tom Scholar was the most experienced permanent yeah, well, secretary you could they, ask for. I think maybe she that was the them. thing because they wanted a new broom that, you know, eventually people have to move on. And there wasn't, they wished to break away from what they call about the dead hand of the Treasury on almost everything and mm. any plan that any politician ever brings in. In comes the Treasury and says, sorry, Minister, that's very brave and I don't think you should do it. So I presume that's why Tom got the heave ho. Um, and then, of course, the system it doesn't like that because he's one of their own and they get very protective. So that all rises up. I think Liz's problem was she didn't take the people, people with her that she needed to. Now, she's not a warm and cuddly human being as we've all seen. I think she lacks emotional intelligence. It does come across a bit like that. I'm not, I mean, I don't know enough about her person. Mm. I remember seeing her years ago and she was much more vibrant, but then she was just a backbencher. People use this term robotic over. There is almost that. Yeah. I remember my son at a Tory event that he was chairing out at her as a former Lib Dem and uh, she got very prickly at that point. <laughs> <laughs> so she is capable of response. <laughs> but I think maybe it's her way of handling it. I mean, I do wonder, and I hate to bring in the feminist thing, but you do wonder if she was a bloke, would she get quite so much grief with the line about her being stupid? would be so often used. But she's not stupid. No, but you hear it all the time that she's I, stupid well, or you do that. and before she became, when she was going for it, she wasn't very bright. She's, she went to read maths at Oxford. Normal people can't actually do that. So mm -hmm. she's not stupid but you will hear it relentlessly about her well, and the robotic a, and I just wonder is there a bit of that. maths and at Oxford and having political intelligence. Oh yes, no, I'm not talking about but yeah. there's this label of stupid and you will see it back in the summer before she stood that was being knocked around as the mm -hmm. foreign secretary that she couldn't read a map. You know, and I just wonder, I'm not defending her, but as many women will tell you, we are measured differently from men. Well, her old, her old thing uh, even. tutor at Oxford said she was bloody minded, didn't he? Yes. Said that no matter what the evidence said, yeah. she would keep going gung-ho mm -hmm. in the face of contrary evidence. And yet she could change her mind about Brexit. And then she changed her mind about everything. <laughs> well, exactly. Except, except on this, and yeah. of course she has changed I her think mind. It is a, and I think it will be studied um, by those who study um, media and politics as a case study of how not to do right. something radical. John is in Belfast. Thank you, uh, Felicity. John, hi. Hi, William. How are you doing? 
Well, you just listen to what you were saying there earlier on that uh, you get inundated with calls asking for a general election. Well, I would be one of those people, you know, because it's wrong that around about 60 to 80,000 people can elect a prime minister with the Tory parties. I mean, the same thing applied with Boris Johnson. He went on to become a prime minister. Mm-hmm. He was elected by the people. This present prime minister is not elected by the people, so we are entitled to a general election, I think. I mean, that is, that is the point. We don't elect prime ministers. We yeah, elect, we elect parties and then the, le- the parties choose their leader who then becomes yeah. the prime well, minister. Yes, I understand that, but uh, that doesn't, I don't think that applies to this trust because mm-hmm. he was not elected. Now, well, she I was. She was elected by the leadership uh, I to know, be leader of the Conservative Party. By the people. That, that's how our system works. Uh, well, that's unfortunate. So, but she does have a legitimate mandate to be Prime Minister, that's I the know, point. But the rules need to be changed. Now, I was reading somewhere this morning, and I think it really sums the Tories up. What this person said was that the Tory party are like a box of dead matches, or a box of dead batteries where you rummage around. Sorry, a box of what? That works. Sorry? A, ba- a, ba- a batch of... A bat- a box of dead batteries? A box of dead batteries. We well, rummaging around to find one that works. Okay. Yes. <laughs> rummaging around to find one that still works. Yeah. Um, I haven't heard that before, but that's a very... Thank you, John. That's a very interesting uh, analogy. And it's an analogy you could apply to almost every party that's in, been in government for more than 10 or 12 years, to be fair, Claire. Isn't that right? I, I think so. And we, we see this across the political cycle, that the party in government does get to a point where people say, actually, we don't like what you're doing. We don't believe that you should be doing it. And it's almost that the power has been given too long. So mm-hmm. there's always been that argument. Yeah. We saw it with Margaret Thatcher. We saw it with Tony Blair. And now we're seeing it again. So I think that's sort of the political cycle of the country. It, it, people have enough and they think that something better is out there. And you Whether run out of is. ideas. And even in a job you might be in, you can run out of ideas unless you have <laughs> always constant new um, ambitions coming in your way. Yes, you do. And I, I think it, it's, it's also the circumstances that you're given. And mm. in as we've seen over the last sort of three years, the political circumstances have been incredible. We've gone from the pandemic, we've seen war in Ukraine, we've seen what's happening with gas and energy prices. Mm. And it's an awful lot. And yeah. I think people just almost want something different and they think the grass is greener on the other side. It isn't necessarily, but perhaps they just need a different way of thinking. Clear. I I hope that's not the case. Can I ask you this? Because a number of people are saying this. Let, let's throw it out there. Uh, to what extent do you think, Claire, that what we're seeing is really the, the outworking of the logic of Brexit? Uh, a move away from a European-centred approach to politics. A lot of Brexiteers wanted to move towards libertarian-type American-style economics, get shot of the European rules, so they could do precisely the kind of thing that Liz Truss was planning to do. In fact, I think Dominic Cummings said when Liz Truss first announced the mini-budget, he said, this is what Brexit was about, doing this kind of economic policy. This was the whole point of Brexit. Oh, I mean, this is the argument I think that's going to run and run. Well, that's um, what he said. That's what he said. I th- I think it's very, very difficult because parts of her budget I didn't disagree with. There is a certain amount of me that quite liked what she was doing and the pro-growth aspect of it. However, when you put it all together and do it at once, it was too much. And it just feels a little like it was uh, a test paper for an economics degree. It's it, all very nice in principle, and you can see how the, the it could work out in the future. Mm-hmm. But market conditions weren't a part mm. of that. When you're looking at something on a piece of paper and you work through, it doesn't take into account what is going on day to day. So I think it. yes, there is a little bit of that. I, I don't like the constant harping back to this is what Brexiteers wanted. And I say that as a Brexiteer. I think we need to move away from that. It's not a helpful argument mm-hmm. to have. And actually clouds the judgment going forwards because people are going to just take this very binary approach to that person is a Remainer, that person is a Brexiteer, therefore we agree, disagree, you know, fill it in as you will. Yeah. So I think that does actually need to stop. Yeah. And some of this is sensible, it just wasn't sensible to have it all at once. And I think Felicity George Osborne at one point said of Liz Truss, how can you say you are 
a free marketeer. You want to have an economy that's market-led and then pay no attention to the markets. And, and bring in this massive, massive subsidy for the electricity markets and gas markets. I mean, that's the other thing. You know, I was just thinking when you were talking about the, the, the sort of free marketeer thing. Well, then you, you know, and then you, you promised to pay the electricity companies and the gas companies as much as you wouldn't have done needed. that. Well, I think I, I, I don't know what we do about. Oh, what, what were you done with people's mortgage bills? What, what people's... Well, the mortgage is a different thing. It's the energy, energy that's really what, frightening what, what people. Have, what, well, what were you done about their energy bills? Exactly. I, Ten well, thousand pounds a month. I know it, it's beyond what, and the in the small business sector. Can any government not? It is you terrifying. Just walk away exactly. From that. Well, I mean, it, it, you know, if you wanted to get, we were here. You wouldn't want to start. Well, if you want to get, to of there, course, you wouldn't start yeah. from here. I mean, our energy be, um, uh, policy for the past ten years has been exceptionally short-sighted, shall yeah. we say, and has failed to look at the potential for shocks. It just didn't, yeah. and we just closed our gas storage. But when it's you incredible were choosing we between, did that. Uh, when you were choosing between Rishi Sunak and Liz Truss, they were both signed up oh, to, yeah. to an energy yeah. package. No, well, I mean, that unfortunately... the reason why you chose one over the other. No, right? something has to be done. And I mean, you know, that was the case. You know, it is, people are going to be absolutely terrified this winter. And when you see the prices, and you think, my heavens, how on earth is that going to happen? Another lot of sweaters is not enough. But didn't you Tory party members who were voting for Liz Trust, you, you were driven principally by the thought of tax cuts. That's no, what you wanted. No, it wasn't just that. That might lead to growth. No, I, I, that I, might help get growth. Rishi just seemed too, too much of a sort of man of the city and all that sort of thing as well. We thought she would be different. And people, people were uncomfortable about Rishi and his all his connections, the sort of globalist stuff. The, then there's the whole issue about his tax circumstances. You remember, you and I have discussed this. The, the and his wife. Status yeah, well, that's his wife. But he, he has. That, they? Well, yes, but I mean, the idea that if you thought you could be the leader of the country and your wife didn't pay the tax, the income tax in the UK mm. and the income she made abroad, and he had a green card. I mean, I still very wonder. Very strange, that wasn't it? That was very odd. To yeah. me, that didn't. I mean, that really did stick in my mind. That mm -hmm. did not suggest a man who was truly committed to the country he wished to run it's you know it's more than just um the numbers and the economy it's also character and that is one of the things people vote on too it was the reason why most of us held to hold our nose and vote for boris who do you think should be the next leader oh lord well kemi was who everybody wanted kemi badnock mm -hmm. but the problem with kemi is she hasn't had a lot of experience and my concern would be if she comes in now to this this dog's dinner of a political party that i'm strange enough, still a member of, it might destroy her, whereas maybe we should give let her be the next one. So, best of luck to whoever takes it. Of that list I gave out, Richie Sunak, Penny Morden, Jeremy Hunt, Ben Wallace, that, that seems to be the, the list. Yeah, well, I know nothing right? about Wallace apart from Afghanistan, so, and I mean, it wasn't exactly a glorious uh, retreat, was it? So, um, would we be having to say Rishi because he's a true Brexiteer? I, there isn't an answer. Oh my goodness. It really is. Uh, Mary's in South Belfast. Hi, Mary. Do you have an answer? Who would you like to be Prime yes, Minister? I do Mary? have an answer, and don't vote for any of them. Yes. That's what I would say to the Conservative grassroots. Don't vote for Looks any like of them. Not going to get a vote, Mary. One of them, here, here, Mary. <laughs> not one of them have the range of skills and competencies, and indeed. Um, the, 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 the creative thinking... But Mary, we're going to need a Prime Minister. Who's it, who moment. should it be? Who should be the Prime Minister? Yeah, well, that's the question. I think there should be a general election You're and not let some get that. new blood the Turkeys uh, don't vote for Christmas. The public. But my, my point was, I think Liz, Truss, Liz should resign. I don't... I can't imagine how she can let someone else step in, sort out her mess and still face the public and think she's the leader of the country. I mean, my goodness. I think um, uh, Felicity Houston just, just agreed with you, Mary. I think Felicity Houston just agreed with you that there should be a general election at this I point. Pers personally, Mary, I think we should have a general election and I think that... Um, most of the Tory MPs will lose their seats, and to be quite honest, it serves them jolly well right. You're saying there's a Conservative Party member? Yes, because of how the badly they've behaved. Tory white by this. It, it's it's coming anyway, and I'd like those who have caused much of this to bear the brunt of it. And I would suggest right. that the members who normally go out and help them in canvas, who apparently are totally unimportant to them because they know better, just leave them the MPs to it and see My how goodness. they get on. Claire. Uh, that's Felicity Houston, who's <laughs> probably one of the best-known Conservative Party members in this part of the world, saying Tory wipeout at this point would be better than this lot staying in. I know, see, I fundamentally disagree because I don't want there to be uh, a Labour government coming in and if we went for a general election, that would be How bad the possibility could it get, of the Claire? results. 
Well, I think it would get an awful lot worse. Really? I do think that actually the Conservative Party, when they pull themselves together, can turn this around. I don't see that we need to call for Keir Starmer whatsoever, either now or in the future. I would much right. rather have a Conservative government. Peter, what do you think? Well, I think there's going to be a general election in 2024. I don't think it's going to happen before then. And I think what the plan for any Conservative leader has to be is to try to claw back that difference. I think it, it's unlikely that the Conservatives will be ahead in 2024. But four or five months ago, Boris Johnson was talking about a third term. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. you know, things happen very, very quickly in politics. And goodness, um, what were we talking about two years ago? Mm -hmm. Things move quickly. And if they do turn this around, Peter, we could be in a different place in 2024. Yes, indeed. And I think it depends who, it, it absolutely depends who the next leader is, whether they bring stability, whether they calm things. But I think you have a number of factors, right. not just the turmoil within the Conservative Party, but actually the turmoil in people's lives, the fact yeah. that economically we're in such a bad state and people vote with their pocketbooks. And people that is a perfectly natural and empathy, reasonable thing to do. For sure. Yeah, and, and, Thank and also you. the Conservative government has been in power for 12 years. It will probably be in power for 14 years. And uh, people, people sometimes say, give the other guys a chance. Thank you all very much. Felicity Houston, Peter Cardwell and Claire Purcell. This week, BBC Northern Ireland is celebrating Book Week. In all those books, something for everyone. I'm Holly Hamilton. And I'm Mark Simpson. Radio Ulster will be exploring the joy of reading across the week too. Culminating with the reading memories and recommendations of local personalities. You know what I love is that you said that it's a dream, you know, it's just reading these books, it's just doing things you dream about babysitting. That's... <laughs> as well as some book-inspired musical treats from the Ulster Orchestra. In Read All About It Special Edition. Four o'clock on Sunday afternoon on Radio Ulster and Sounds. Yes, indeed. It is Book Week on BBC Northern Ireland and at Libraries NI. I know you love it when we introduce you to...